final content panel of the of the afternoon is identity culture and branding and we will begin with uh, Professor Mark Bender who is uh, chair of the Department of East Asian Language and Literature um, at Ohio State University uh, he is also a faculty member of the Center for uh, Folklore Studies um, at, uh, at Ohio State and specializes in um, uh, research on traditional performance and performance connected literature uh, in China um, has done some remarkable translation work of uh, literature um, or you know oral uh, traditions and, and literature traditions of Hmong, Hmong uh, Miao, uh, Yi and other uh, uh, ethnic minority groups in southwest China. Um, so we'll hear from, uh, from, from Mark first and then uh, he'll be followed by uh, Hiromu Nagahara from uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, Hiromu is, um, he has a very fancy uh, professor uh, title. He's the uh, Cecil and Ida Green Career Development Professor um, of History at, uh, at MIT. And he studies uh, history of modern Japan um, uh, with research interests in the history of media and popular culture uh, in the 20th, 20th century Japan. And then finally, we'll hear from um, our own Hunchit Kim, who is uh, a professor in the uh, College of Media uh, Communication and Information, um, who um, has, has been a huge asset to us at the Center for Asian Studies um, in his work on um, Korean broadcasting, Korean media, Korean popular culture, um, which is what he'll be um, sharing his uh, thoughts with us today. So uh, without further ado, we'll start with Mark. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. I've been familiar with uh, Tim's work for a long time and use it in uh, my classes uh, quite often. And uh, so, but it's the first time we ever met, so I was uh, really happy that that could happen today. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to be talking about the genre of poetry uh, in uh, a region of upland, uh, Southeast Asia, Southwest China, and some contiguous areas. And um, I'm talking about poetry, and this is maybe in an alternative to maybe business or governmental modes of communication and thinking about uh, this uh, region. So my uh, paper will consist of two parts. Uh, the first part will situate ethnic minority poetry production in Southwest China in particular within multiple communicative mediums within regional and global frameworks. In the discussion of poetic production in the region, I will also comment on the status of live performance contexts and virtual online poetry. The second part will present a brief case study of the poetry of Aka Wu, also known as Lo Ching Chun, an e-poet from southern Sichuan province situating his work within context of verbal art and associated performances in the city of Xichang. Now in recent years, let me get to a graphic here, uh, public sculptures on the themes of Norsu Yi tradition, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the Norsu Yi, including a moon maiden fairy goddess, daughter of the moon uh, sculpture in traditional dress, seated upon a sheep's head and strubbing an E-styled moon guitar, which have marked the dynamically shifting urban landscape and become the target of Aku's pointed microblogging, a medium which has become a subset of his poetic works and a subject being explored in more detail by one of my students, uh, Xiao Wenyuan, at a paper she'll deliver at a conference at Berkeley uh, next week. Uh, now, in part one, uh, here, let me just show you this picture here for a minute. Shows the picture of this uh, E goddess uh, sitting uh, atop this head, and her foot is touching this. Now, the reason that Aku got angry about this is this is some sort of violation of cultural taboos, okay? Uh, so this becomes a part of the uh, urban landscape. You have these uh, artists who go in and uh, create these sculptures, not necessarily knowing exactly all the nuances of the culture. Uh, but Aku, uh, who was, uh, grew up uh, in the rural areas and very, very familiar uh, with uh, traditional E customs and so forth, um, has taken it upon himself as sort of a social critic uh, within this uh, city of Xichang, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is the capital of this large autonomous region uh, for the, uh, or rather prefecture, for the E people in uh, southern Sichuan province. And he does this through the medium of microblogging. Okay? Um, so let me just uh, show you what one of the microblogs is. 
And this is his comment. Um, the fabricated moon daughter rides mindlessly above a sheep's head, declaring this mountain city's most profound misreading of history and most barbaric blasphemy. So he sh shoots this out to his followers, which includes some uh, government officials, and uh, sort of pokes, uh, pokes fun at things uh, that way. So, um, in, uh, let's move on uh, a little bit farther. In the part one, I'll focus on interpretive frameworks that relate both to traditional oral and oral connected poetry and contemporary verse written by ethnic minority indigenous poets in southwest China and contiguous upland areas in Eastern Asia, which have been my areas of interest for a number of years. The interpretive frameworks I identify, and there are certainly more, are one, a marginalized position within a dynamic of China versus the rest of the world in terms of multimedia, literary, folklore, media, and associated studies. Two, a more focused view in which media expressions and research fit into and juxtapose within a mosaic of creative expression and research in this upland area called Zomia, which is this kind of constructed sort of place uh, in upland Asia, somewhat similar to the way we construct Appalachia here in the United States. And this uh, area is uh, connected to regions as far away, at least in my view, as Mongolia and Inner Mongolia. And number three, the frame of the global indigenous movement characterized by Chad Allen as trans-indigenous. So this is sort of a way of looking at indigenous cultures around the world as they sort of step up and create their own uh, discourses. And number four, the global local eco-critical movement, which in the works of critics such as Joni Adamson is linked also with the global indigenous movement. I'll focus my discussion primarily on the latter three frames, noting that mainstream Han poetry including internet poetry, is a relatively well-covered subject in contemporary studies of Chinese literature. So here's a, a map of Zomia. This is just one of many configurations of this area. Sometimes these lines you know, move farther up, far around. But again, it's just a sort of a constructed area that uh, Scott has written about um, and so forth. Here's a... Uh, satellite photo uh, of the region, these uh, broken up lands uh, at the foothills of the Himalayas. So um, ethnic poetry uh, in this region, which I've uh, been looking at about the last five years, I find it to be this uh, lively, multi-dimensional, multi-media contemporary poetry machine uh, scene. There's a lot of hot spots in this area. Uh, one of them would be in Shillong, in uh, northeast uh, India, and then another would be in southwest China, particularly in the city of uh, Chengdu. What's interesting to me as I've sort of looked uh, through this area in the last few years has been that there's a gradual mutual awareness of poetries in the region. A lot of these poets writing in southwest China really had no idea that people in Northeast India and Myanmar, uh, Mongolia were writing up very, very similar themes. Even though they come from different backgrounds, the themes about cultural change and about uh, ecological uh, problems um, I find in both of these uh, regions. And they're very, very much hooked into indigenous ways of thinking, uh, sort of an animistic underplaying through a lot of these poems, a lot of drawing on nature imagery, uh, imagery of ritual, and uh, so forth. Um, here again is this term, uh, trans-indigenous, which uh, Chad Allen, uh, who works at Ohio State, uh, put forward. Now this is a picture here of a street scene from uh, Impal in uh, Manipur, an area which I've also uh, uh, traveled to recently. Uh, here is a uh, ethnic museum, which is outside of uh, Impal. And uh, in this area, uh, local artists uh, 
interact with the uh, local folklore, in this case, carvings, and they create paintings, writing, poetry, and so forth. And we see very similar things going on in places in southwest China and so forth. This is a hillside in Nagaland. We see these uh, terraced rice fields here. Uh, we see very, very similar things in uh, southwest China and uh, Burma as well. So this is part of this ecological impact uh, which is carried out by uh, uh, people in this region. And uh, this comes into the poems. You get a lot of poems about uh, this kind of uh, interactions with these upland uh, fields and so forth, uh, what's happened to the birds, uh, the animals, and the plants, and so forth. So these are the areas that I have been looking at, uh, the poets in uh, southwest China uh, from various groups such as the Yi, Miao, uh, Hua, uh, so forth. The, most of these are Sinophone poets. They're writing in Chinese. However, there are a few who are writing in indigenous languages. Northeast India, most of them write in English. Uh, but also some in their native tongue, such as Kashi. Uh, I went to Myanmar last summer uh, in search of poets. I didn't have any leads there. I had a couple of telephone numbers. One of them worked. Went over there and found some poets in a Mandalay and uh, found out that their writings on the mountains, the rivers, the waters, and so forth, uh, there's resonances there all across the region. And I also, uh, in the summer of 2013, uh, traveled to uh, Mongolia and met up with uh, poets there as well. So a lot of shared themes on cultural ecolo ecological change. Uh, I'm going to show you a series of uh, photos here. This is the big international airport in Kunming, which is opening sort of a window to Southeast Asia. Uh, here's one of the Burmese poets, uh, expat poet Coco Tet in uh, Europe, who uh, is representative of many of the Burmese poets. Uh, Temsa Lao, um, here, uh, an Ao Naga poet from Northeast India, and uh, Urao Ilu, who I've uh, worked with, a Wa poet from Southwest China, uh, Mona Zote uh, from Mizoram, a fantastic poet, and uh, these were four of the poets that I met in uh, Myanmar uh, last summer. And also I worked with the translator of Galsan Suk Batar in uh, Mongolia. Um, let me just move on uh, through a few of these other uh, pictures. I just want to get, uh, this is some of the puppet theater, which is another thing that I uh, want to stress is that these poets are writing out of contexts that have a lot of oral performance traditions. They carry on some of this within uh, their writing, so there's a lot of resonances within, within uh, that as well. Uh, the E ethnic group is where Aku Wu Wu uh, has his roots, and I uh, don't have time to go over this, but this is some of the E traditional costume that was reflected on that uh, statue that we saw at the beginning, and this is where uh, it's located. Uh, the Nosu themselves uh, have uh, various uh, websites uh, representing them. Um, there's a, an intellectual group of Nosu uh, living in Beijing, uh, and some of them uh, do microblogs and uh, such as that. This is a group of uh, e poets and some ones from other. Uh, groups that were in a study abroad program uh, with me uh, last summer, and we've been doing this about five years. Uh, this is uh, Aku Wu Wu uh, performing his poetry. And you can see that there's some E characters in the back because he writes in E language as well. And here are uh, just some images of the E folk culture. And quickly, uh, in this uh, context of this uh, city of Xichang 
that uh, Aku writes about with the, uh, e, uh, with the Moon Maiden and so forth, does his micro blogging on. This is a restaurant where you go in and it's an e-themed restaurant and it has uh, live performances. Uh, where you uh, walk in uh, in the uh, foyer you got this multimedia stuff going on. You have the displays of traditional e-dress. You go up and you eat traditional e-food. Uh, then there's these performances put on stage. Uh, these are, this guy is a traditional ritualist here. Uh, and then people coming out in these uh, traditional clothes uh, doing the song and dance routines. And here's uh, playing their young women, playing the moon guitar just like the girl in the statue. Um, other, you know, sort of fantastic costumes which were along traditional lines but of the upper class. And then these images of the moon maidens and fairies uh, come out onto the stage and of course you've got little kids with their little cell phones and this immediately goes into cyberspace. And then uh, here's uh, afterwards where some of the performers go around and sing at the tables for uh, tourists. So in summary, uh, poets across uh, Zomia, if you want to use that word, and related areas are among the many cultural actors utilizing an enhanced array of communicated channels to voice their messages and feelings. The poetic production exists in a multifaceted landscape and of traditional and tradition-oriented performance. Uh, issues of cultural survival and ecological change surface over and over in the poetries from this region, which are communicated orally in print and online, and join in various ways in a transnational, global, indigenous presence. Akawuwu's multimedia work in print, online, and in live performance, and the nightly performances of E, uh, traditional culture, are but two examples of many of uh, this dynamic of connectedness and agency at play today. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Hiromi Nagahara. I came from Boston last night, uh, thinking that I was coming from spring to another spring. Uh, but it looks like the sun is coming out finally, so maybe, maybe we'll still uh, be lucky. Um, thank you so much to Tim uh, for inviting me and to for everyone here at the Center for uh, Asian Studies. Um, feel so welcome. It's such a pleasure and delight to be here. Uh, and also I find it uh, such a delight to uh, be with other people uh, who also know about Asia but are not just historians. Uh, and I think that's one of the pleasures that I've had uh, studying media uh, that I get to encounter and do interdisciplinary work in a real way. And I really enjoy that and look forward to our work uh, during this weekend. Um, so. Continuing on with what I think, uh, as it turned out, I think this panel has kind of turned out into the songs and dance portion of our day. Um, I'm going to talk about songs or music. Um, but I want to do that uh, in order to, I think, touch on one of the key themes that is emerging out of uh, that, all of the conversations that we have today. And that's the question of democracy, ultimately. I think we, we are ultimately, and we, en we have ended up talking about uh, freedom of information, how culture becomes more free, more accessible, uh, media, etc. Uh, it seems like we are talking about democracy uh, in, all of, in, in all different ways. Um, and I want to add a different twist to it through my talk, namely by, um, I feel like rightfully, I think from the morning today, we really encountered uh, questions about democracy and media in the context of state power. Uh, how state policies, state actions uh, negatively, uh, maybe in many cases, or positively affect uh, how media, culture, media uh, develops, evolves, et cetera. Um, but I think there's already been, already been hints at other kinds of power that's at work. Uh, I think Tim, when he was talking about China, US uh, connections already, uh, I think in the question and answer session, you talked about nationalism. So there's a hint there. Uh, and I'm sorry, to, uh, is it, Annie Ann, uh, who talked about Indonesia, um, you, know, you were you know, hinting towards sort of ideology, or not hinting, right? You're in, in some sense at the center of your talk is, is sort of the relationship between 
uh, media and not state, a non-state uh, actor and ideology in this case. Uh, and I want to push that a little bit further by asking the question of does or did, in my case, because I would be taking us to the past, uh, mass-mediated culture, the rise of mass-mediated culture, necessarily signify the cultural flattening or cultural democratization? And, and my answer, cut to cut to the chase, is usually not really. Um, now, I ask this question because I think we do nevertheless have this image of the spread of mass media, media mass media culture, oftentimes leading to some kind of general flattening of culture and lowering of barriers, democratization in general. Um, certainly that's the kind of narrative that Silicon Valley would like to sort of propagate, right? It is the sort of everyone can do it, everyone can make it, everyone can access it. It's the, you know, it's the spirit of YouTube as it were. Um, or in a very real sense, I think Mark has just pointed us an example of real ways in which sort of groups, uh, indigenous groups, and other sort of cultural practitioners who may not have had sort of access to central sort of cultural centers, uh, uh, media capitals, as it were, uh, are getting new exposure precisely because of these new technologies. And I think those are all very true. And I think these are convincing narratives, not just because they're comfortable, but also because there are the ways in which we have narrated broader histories of our own societies, including Japan, which in many ways have been talked about sort of, especially in the modern era, as having the history of certainly ups and downs, but of general democratization. It starts out in the Meiji period, where there's a major overthrow of a samurai elite. Uh, there's sort of Western constitutional monarchy that emerges. Uh, it has makings of a thriving parliamentary democracy, and then that kind of goes down the drain for a little bit in the 30s, but then emerges after the war. And, you know, middle class becomes a reality, societies become flat, culture becomes flat. But I want to take us to two moments in Japanese history, and especially in the history of how music actually turned into a form of media culture in Japan, uh, in order to think about how both existing and new types of hierarchies uh, actually are re-embedded or embedded newly into the media culture, emerging media culture. Uh, and so the two periods that I want to talk about is the Meiji period, the late 19th century, when Japan does go through this major transition. Uh, and secondly, I want to talk about the late 1920s through 1930s, when Japan goes through uh, as in the case of actually uh, US and other parts of Europe, sort of first major wave of uh, explosion of mass media. So Meiji period, um, it is a period of social and political flattening. A samurai elite uh, decides to overthrow their own regime in some sense, uh, the Tokuga shogunate, and instead they, what they do as part of reform is they abolish status system, the system that divided samurai from everybody else, uh, abolished a system where hierarchy was natural, where inequality was natural, uh, and at least legally turned everyone, almost everyone in Japan, into commoners. Um, and yet in the context of Meiji state, uh, focusing on music and sort of thinking about music seriously, you see two types of hierarchy uh, emerge in its importance. Um, now, at first there was actually no reason why the Meiji state would have been interested or the Meiji elites would have been interested in music. And that's one of the two hierarchies that I want to talk about. One of the things that, they would, that would happen to these uh, elites is whenever they go into when they're, whenever they get to these Western capitals, they get invited into these, something like this, a very large Western style room, maybe very much with uh, fireplaces on both ends, certainly with a grand piano on one corner of the room. Uh, and what they would encounter is men and women twirling about dancing. And the only thing that they would really feel at that moment is confusion and disgust. 
Uh, and the main reason why is, uh, especially for the samurai elite, there was a fairly strict gender uh, segregation. And it just seemed like, in their eyes, it just seemed like sort of an example of Western lewdness, that men and women were so freely engaging with each other. Uh, and Western music in general just sounded very strange to them, uh, not entirely pleasant. Um, but as they went on these journeys, and especially in 1871 uh, through 73, they go on this world circumnavigating mission called the Iwakura mission that takes them through the United States all the way into uh, Europe. They encounter Western music as a sign of Western civilization. Uh, and they began to see, okay, well, maybe it's helpful in encouraging patriotism, maybe it seems that all civilized societies, Western societies, uh, have grand pianos, uh, maybe we should do something like that too. Um, and so they encounter a second kind of hierarchy, that is the idea of Western civilization as standard of civilization, and they adopt that uh, very deeply. And so those two hierarchies, samurai aversion to music and the acceptance of West as a standard of civilization and therefore Western music, uh, becomes part of the key component of how the Japanese state puts music into compulsory education system. Um, and that also leads to the creation of Japan's music establishment uh, through things like national conservatories and things like that. So there you see the making of a cultural infrastructure at the end of the Meiji period. Now, skip ahead a couple of decades into the early 1920s, and you begin to see a mass media revolution. Publication uh, of mass journals and books sort of explode. We're, we not, we're now talking about circulation of millions. Uh, radio begins in 1920, 1925, uh, broadcasting nationally. By 1945, about 45% of Japanese households are wired or connected by radio, which is uh, one of the highest rates in the, in the world by that time. And music industry. Companies like Victor and Columbia began major operations in Japan by 1928 and kickstart the industry. And at that point, observers are wondering, is this the end of cultural hierarchy? Is this the end of cultural establishment? That's certainly the way that it seemed uh, for people. Uh, and one sort of key observers of the period noted that music no longer seems to be sort of coming naturally out of people's uh, folklore or tradition, uh, but they're being made by industries. They're literally canned music. Um, and so it may well seem like mass media is beating, in some sense, the kind of state-led hierarchy that was uh, reestablished in the context of the Meiji period. Uh, but I want to play very quickly the kinds of musics that were uh, that were created in this context and talk about why actually this is a sign of uh, the same hierarchies actually being re-inscribed. So the first one that I'm playing for you is a 1929 hit called Tokyo March. And it's the original recording. So this was the kind of music that would be uh, created by the music industry of this period. It's very musically syncretic, that is incorporating both Western and Japanese musical idioms. Um, they're almost always about two, minute, two minutes and a half long because that was the technological limitation of that period. Um, and this is the kind of sound that is seen to be taking over Japanese sort of uh, popular culture. Um, another one is this. Ooh, so sad. <laughs> wow, the machine didn't like it. Um, so what you have begun to hear is a song called My Blue Heaven which is actually a translation of American hit. It's, a, it's an originally American song. Um, and this actually, this song, My Blue Heaven, um, I think most Americans have forgotten about it. Every time I ask my students, have you heard of this song? They say, no. Most Japanese will remember it. Um, and it's 
partly because they use it for commercial these days, but it's also for another reason. I think the person who translated this song was a guy named Horiuchi Keizo, who uh, was born to a wealthy family, imbibed in Western music in his youth, uh, and then came to the U.S., studied mechanical engineering in Michigan, University of Michigan, and, and at MIT as well. But in both places, n instead of just studying engineering, he also uh, became heavily involved with the music scene. He would collect records, he would participate in choirs, and uh, every week, weekend, he would, in, in Boston, he would go to the Boston Symphony and also occasionally to New York. And once he comes back to Japan, so much for his engineering education, uh, he turns into one of the first and foremost of Japanese musical critics. Uh, and so he translates not just this song, but several other songs. He participates uh, in, eventually becomes a uh, he, he's put in charge of the Western music programming of the state radio broadcaster that begins broadcasting in 1925. He goes into uh, becoming the ch leading publisher of music journals. Uh, he's also involved in uh, sound. Uh, once uh, He's also involved in film. Once sound film uh, becomes uh, available in, in early, mid-1930s. And in fact, Japan's first talkie sound film uh, featured My Blue Heaven as the theme music, which is, I think, another reason why Japanese remember it to this day. And what he's doing in... Uh, <laughs> um, that, that, this chorus is really nice. um, Anyway, so what he's doing in all of this is actually not caving to the sort of what was seen to be the emerging popular song genre. Instead, what he's doing is carrying out the mission that the Meiji state has set earlier in the 19th, 19th century, namely popularizing Western music uh, in Japan. And he does this, uh, in, in other words, what mass media does when it, it, when it erupts in Japan in the mid-1920s mid into the 1930s, it not only enables the creation of a new kind of perhaps potentially culturally flattening genre like popular songs, but it also enables practitioners of existing music establishment like Horiuchi to actually uh, spread his mission and carry on into uh, the post-war period. Um, and I think this is an important point because well into the post-war period, most Japanese elites, uh, not just Horiuchi, would actually denigrate uh, popular songs and other forms of mass culture. Uh, and they will be very, very uncomfortable. And in some sense, this is a very different kind of picture that you, of how Japanese elites interact with popular culture, especially in comparison to how they have come to do more recently when the Japanese government is trying to sell cool Japan around the world. Um, and I think the bigger lesson to draw out of this is the question of what kinds of hierarchies, uh, both old and new, might still actually be operating in our broader media culture today. I think we've already seen some hints of it. Um, and even in Silicon Valley itself, I think we're seeing some tensions, uh, especially in recent protests over the rising rent in the Bay Area, for example. We see sort of the difference between the, the, the rhetoric of cultural flattening by, by media versus uh, this general sense, uh, I think, that's growing not just in Japan but around the world that we live in an increasingly economically, uh, socially stratified media, a uh, stratified world. Uh, and so what does it mean um, when we live in a world that, it, that sees such significant gaps in wealth uh, to claim to have a culture that is universal, flat, mass. Uh, perhaps our culture is not nearly as flat as we might tend to think it is. Thank you very much. I'm sure some of you may have seen a presentation by uh, Korean American scholars uh, talking about the, the latest growing trend of the Korean popular entertainment contents. Uh, you know, um, circulating online, offline, and uh, the popularity of K-pop, including the latest success of Psy's Gangnam Style. Um, my focus of presentation about the Korean wave uh, also uh, touch those you know, areas, but uh, I have more interest in how it was successful and 
the role of the Korean government to make it more successful. So, uh, as my title says, uh, soft power public diplomacy uh, initiated by the Korean government to make the Korean culture uh, successful globally. So, during the last two decades, South Korea's cultural uh, products in the forms of pop music, TV dramas, and movies have gained popularity in many countries in Asia and the rest of the world. We call the Korean wave or Hallyu, uh, based on uh, what the Chinese media coined the word back in 2009. The first sign of the wave began in the late 1990s when Korean television network called MBC uh, exported its uh, popular uh, weekly uh, drama called what is love all about to China? And it became an instant success. Uh, then came another drama, miniseries drama, uh, produced by KBS, a national broadcaster. And it is titled Winter Sonata. And Winter Sonata uh, became a cultural phenomenon uh, because, uh, as you can see, those two main characters, uh, especially the man is deeply adored by the Japanese middle-aged uh, drama fans uh, and uh, predominantly female. So that was back in 2003 and 2004 when it was aired on a J Japanese uh, national broadcaster NHK and instantly uh, the tourism in Korea soared in number and the many uh, Japanese uh, female uh, fans visited Korea right in front of those movie location set and took pictures and visited uh, the actual house. Uh, you know, in the drama, it was uh, featured as the male character's home. And the same is true with other locations and even more adventurous Japanese fans uh, explored into the room of the male character. Even uh, today, uh, in Korean uh, royal palaces in Seoul, there are many Asian tourists and many of them choose to leave their commemorative pictures with the cutouts of the, uh, one of the uh, characters from Korean uh, miniseries drama, which is called A Jewel in the Palace. Uh, I also had this kind of uh, you know, uh, cutouts when I visited uh, Graceland, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and this is what's happening in Korea. And uh, the city of Chuncheon is a uh, birthplace of this drama, and uh, the local government of Chuncheon uh, started uh, gaining uh, huge business profits by hosting all these foreign tourists into that city. And uh, nobody in Korea wants to travel Chuncheon that often. Next came K-pop, the Korean popular music. And uh, it showed a cultural hybridity of East and West, just like you know, in any other countries in Asia. And um, it is uh, elaborate performances by Korean uh, entertainers with synchronized dance moves and hand gestures. And the most successful idol bands uh, include Girls' Generation. Uh, they are extremely popular in Japan. Even a couple of weeks ago, they topped the chart of weekly a Japanese Oricon, uh, you know, uh, music chart. And Super Junior to anyone. Uh, I'm, I'm just hoping uh, this uh, YouTube video will run because, you know, instead of uh, I keep trying to is explain what K-pop really sounds like, this is one of them. <sighs> no, this is a commercial. Okay, right there. Oh. Come on now. I said one, two, three. I just don't need a nickel and a chicken and cum. I'm sick and tired. No, we suddenly a Chong 
하지 말고 너나 잘해 네 그런 동정 따윈 필요 없어 uh, I said a one and two and three and four So as you just saw, uh, entertainers are Korean, but obvious that uh, it is not really Korean style, traditional singing and uh, music. It's just a combination of East and the West. And even some of the lyrics uh, that she sings, it's English. So uh, it is clear that Korean entertainment industry wants to target not Korean audiences, it's global audience. So K-pop, idol bands, TV dramas, movies, and video games were popular with young audiences beyond Asia, uh, as far as Middle East and Europe. And uh, the news magazine Economist dubbed the Korean um, cultural products as Asia's foremost trendsetter. And Time magazine uh, called the success of the Korean wave as the best export item from South Korea. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, different approach from social science here uh, because uh, it is important to look at how it became so popular uh, not only in Asia but uh, around the world. It's perhaps the effort made by the Korean government officials and uh, industry uh, together uh, with the basic idea called public diplomacy. Uh, public diplomacy is the approach to engage with citizens of other countries by using a different type of means, including uh, art, knowledge, media, language, economic, and humanitarian aids. And it aims to promote multi, uh, mutual understanding and interests of concerned parties. So, what is important here is public diplomacy intends to persuade target audiences uh, and let them change their attitude and the perceptions toward a particular country, particular culture, in this case, uh, Korea and Korean entertainment culture. And the public uh, diplomacy utilizes many different media platforms, but what is interesting is they use a number of mass communication product and the platform, including radio, television, uh, music, DVD, computer games, an internet uh, blogging website, and the internet streaming video websites. And also public diplomacy, uh, in the long run, they target foreign audiences uh, by using human and cultural exchanges. Uh, that includes a language training of Korean and uh, cultural exchange programs uh, you know, between uh, the countries uh, far away from Korea and they invite students and uh, people uh, to visit Korea and uh, have uh, some tour program uh, to stop at the you know, K-pop industry hub in Gangnam. South Korean government indeed saw the potential of the Korean wave as soft power. Now, what is soft power? Soft power is uh, something that uh, persuade people by attraction instead of coercion. So what is hard power? Military invasion, economic sanctions. Uh, when America wanted to approach Japan in the 19th century, uh, they used gunboats instead of K-pop. <laughs> so, it was the age of hard power, but in the 21st century, it's the age of soft power. This concept of soft power was uh, you know, suggested by a uh, Harvard uh, scientist, uh, Joseph Nye, and uh, it is widely circulated in international relations area. Uh, the Korean government uh, increased the investment in pop cultural content industry as early as uh, 2000 and totaling $917 million as loans and credit guarantees. And also Korean government uh, supported uh, overseas distribution of K-pop contents and the Korean films and the Korean food by sending money to uh, overseas branch of Korean cultural centers and the Korean uh, embassies throughout the world. Uh, by 2012, the popularity of Korean uh, 
TV dramas, pop music reached its peak. Uh, but also there is a very uh, ominous sign that uh, Koreans have uh, witnessed. Negative sentiment against Hallyu uh, started growing. And uh, the negative uh, anti-Hallyu trend uh, can be perceived in two different forms. The first, protective trade barriers, and the second, political backlash. The first, uh, protective trade barriers include in China, Thailand, Vietnam, and uh, some other countries in Asia. They started imposing uh, you know, the quota system to restrict the total hours of Korean uh, dramas, films, and the uh, K-pop content uh, being uh, broadcast to its domestic television channels. And also, um, political backlash uh, started uh, especially in Japan uh, in the summer of 2012. Then South Korean President Lee Myung-bak visited Dokdo, which is uh, you know, a controversial uh, territorial dispute uh, between Japan and Korea. And immediately after that uh, state visit to the island, uh, the diplomatic uh, relations between Korea and Japan uh, deteriorated. And, uh, on top of that, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe continued to visit uh, controversial Yasukuni War Dead Shrine in Tokyo, and that also prompted furious reaction from China and Korea. So, anti Hallyu sentiment is everywhere in Japan, uh, China, and elsewhere. Now, the Korean wave is in crisis. Um, during this time, uh, some Japanese mangas and the books uh, portraying anti-Hallyu uh, trend uh, became uh, bestsellers and there were street protests. But the same is true in Seoul, Korea because we also had anti-Japanese protests. So looks like it's not the failure of the Korean wave itself, it's the failure of public diplomacy. We couldn't engage the citizens of the other countries. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, public opinion poll conducted late last year in Japan. So uh, when uh, the Japanese citizens were asked, do you feel any sense of affinity to Korea? More than 66% said no. But Koreans shouldn't feel too bad about it because uh, they also had a similar question. So how do you feel about the Chinese? And even higher number of uh, the respondent, uh, you know, answer, oh no, we, we don't feel any sense of affinity to China. So, what should we do? A Korean wave, although with uh, great success and the popularity all over the world, now it's time to reconsider. We have to do more effort to engage with the citizens in Japan, China, and elsewhere and the Korean uh, film uh, makers and uh, song producers. Uh, the latest news report in Seoul uh, started uh, you know, reporting that uh, you know, the heyday of the Korean wave is virtually over, at least in Japan, and uh, we are not doing very well uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, before I prepared uh, this, presentation today, I wanted to see that uh, Korean newspaper article online. Couldn't find it. What happened? Korean government, uh, in, one or way, in one way or the other, they just pulled that newspaper article out of online by asking uh, the top editors of the Tongha Yelbo company in Seoul. So, the government is very serious about it, but we'll see what will happen in the next few years. It, it can continue its popularity, but it may just uh, dissipate, just like a uh, Hong Kong movie in the 1980s, which was extremely popular, but now we don't see much uh, uh, you know, presence in the Hong Kong film industry, in the global film market. Thank you.